Dear students, we have studied metabolism of glucose extensively in our previous lectures. Now we are going to start metabolism of monosaccharides and disaccharides other than glucose. Under monosaccharides, we are going to deal with fructose and galactose. And in disaccharides, we are going to see metabolism of lactose in detail. Yeah. Objectives of today's lecture is to study metabolism of fructose and its associated disorders. Then we would see that how mannose is converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Then we would see conversion of glucose to fructose using sorbitol. And then we are going to see metabolism of galactose and its associated disorders. And then we would be learning synthesis of lactose. Glucose is the most common monosaccharide or carbohydrate which is consumed by human beings. Its metabolism we have studied in detail. Two other monosaccharides which play a significant role in energy metabolism and they act as key contributors in energy metabolism are fructose and galactose. One additional function which is played by galactose other than its role in energy metabolism that this is a key component of most of cell structural carbohydrates. Now we're going to start metabolism of fructose. A major dietary source of fructose is sucrose, which is a disaccharide now in the intestine. Sucrose undergoes cleavage and it is resulted into the production of equimolar amounts of fructose and glucose. Glucose can also be found as a free monosaccharide in most of the fruits. You can also find it in honey and you can also find it as the main component of high fructose corn syrup. Fructose can enter into cells without using ticket of insulin. It does not result into the secretion of insulin. Since it is not insulinogenic, so in diabetic individuals or in diabetics, fructose can be administered in place of glucose, but because of its increased lipogenic or atherogenic profile, it is not commonly considered as a good carbohydrate to be given to diabetics. Now this is the figure which is showing that how fructose gets metabolized in cells. Uh, fructose metabolism follows two routes. Uh, fructose may undergo its own metabolism or it can also be linked to glycolysis. Supposedly, if it is linked to glycolysis, then fructose is acted upon by hexokinase and it is converted into fructose 6-phosphate. Then fructose 6-phosphate is acted upon by phosphofructokinase and using ATP fructose 6-phosphate gets converted into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is catalyzed by aldolase A, B or C and two products can be formed. One is dihydroxyacetone phosphate, another is glycerol dehyde 3-phosphate. When fructose follows its own metabolism, then fructokinase specifically recognizes fructose and converts it into fructose 1-phosphate using ATP. Then in the second reaction, fructose 1-phosphate can only be acted upon by aldolase B and it converts fructose 1-phosphate into two products. One is glyceraldehyde, another is dihydroxyacetone phosphate. A, B, C are three isoforms of aldolase enzyme and we can discriminate aldolase as A, B, C according to its body distribution. For example, aldolase B is found in hepatocytes, in kidney and in small intestinal mucosa. You can find aldolase A in most tissues or in cells, for example in erythrocytes or RBCs, while you can find aldolase C in brain cells. Aldolase B 
which is used here only for converting fructose one phosphate into glycyldehyde and dihydroxy acetone phosphate is also named as fructose one phosphate aldolase Aldolase B here can also convert fructose 1,6-bisphosphate into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceldehyde 3-phosphate. Now we are going to start disorders associated with fructose metabolism. We can have fructose available to us in the form of a free monosaccharide. We can also get fructose from cleavage of a disaccharide sucrose in the intestinal cells by sucrase enzyme. Sucrase enzyme cleaves sucrose into equimolar amounts of glucose and fructose. This fructose upon action by fructokinase and using 1 ATP is converted into fructose 1-phosphate. Then it gets cleaved by aldolase B into glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone phosphate. This glyceraldehyde is reduced into glycerol using alcohol dehydrogenase. Here, 1 NADH is oxidized to NAD. This glycerol is then converted into glycerol phosphate using glycerol kinase and 1 ATP. This glycerol phosphate here acts as a precursor for making phosphoglycerides and it can also act as a precursor for tags, triacylglycerols, or neutral fats. This dihydroxyacetone phosphate can be linked with glycolysis here. It is converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate using triose phosphate isomerase, and then it can undergo further reactions of glycolysis and ultimately it results into the production of a keto acid called as pyruvate. This glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is also convertible into dihydroxyacetone phosphate using isomerase. And then this dihydroxyacetone phosphate is converted into glycerol phosphate using glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase. And this glycerol phosphate can again be linked to phosphoglycerides and tags. Glyceraldehyde over here can also be directly converted into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate using triose kinase and 1-ATP is utilized here. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and dihydroxyacetone phosphate can merge together in the presence of aldolase A and can trigger gluconeogenesis by first making fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose 1,6-bisphosphate with the help of bisphosphatase enzyme is converted into fructose 6-phosphate and then by using isomerase it is converted into glucose 6-phosphate. This phosphatase which is called glucose 6-phosphatase can make glucose from glucose 6-phosphate finally. This glucose can also be linked to glycogen metabolism. It is acted upon by hexokinase and it is converted into glucose 6-phosphate and this glucose 6-phosphate acts as a precursor for making glycogen. Now glycogen can be degraded as well and through glycogenolysis this glycogen can be converted back to glucose 6-phosphate and eventually it may produce glucose. There are two main disorders which are associated with fructose metabolism. One is essential fructose urea or fructose urea. Another one is hereditary fructose intolerance or fructose poisoning. This is shortly abbreviated as HFI. Now, essential fructose urea is that kind of uh, disorder of uh, fructose metabolism, which is mostly asymptomatic and does not uh, precipitate into serious complications. This is characterized by lack of fructokinase. So fructokinase may be seen deficient in these patients and fructose cannot be converted into fructose 1-phosphate and elevated or high levels of fructose are seen. It is autosomal recessive and its prevalence rate is 1 out of 1,30,000 individuals may be affected with this disorder. This is a benign condition and just in this disorder we see fructosemia that is elevated levels of fructose in blood and then we see fructose urea that is accumulation of fructose in the urine. Now hereditary fructose intolerance or fructose poisoning, uh, this is characterized by the deprivation or the absence of aldolase B enzyme. When aldolase B enzyme is deficient then fructose 1-phosphate is 
uh, not converted into glyceraldehyde and dihydroxy acetone phosphate and high levels of fructose one phosphate are observed now not only fructose one phosphate can be elevated but the high concentrations of fructose can also be seen this is autosomal recessive disorder and its prevalence prevalence rate is one out of 20000 births Uh, this disorder can result into severe or serious complications and these complications mostly become apparent when the baby is going to be deprived of mother's milk and he or she is going to be fed with uh, maybe fructose directly or maybe with the sucrose. The very first biochemical manifestation of fructose poisoning is severe hypoglycemia. Now, what is the cause of severe hypoglycemia in fructose poisoning? Okay, this is uh, because uh, fructose 1-phosphate is going to be present in high concentration. When fructose 1-phosphate is high, then the level of inorganic phosphate, it drops. And ultimately, the level of ATP also lowers down. When ATP is low, then gluconeogenesis, it cannot take place and hence its rate also lowers down. When there is no gluconeogenesis, then the level of glucose, it also gets dropped. And when there is definitely no glucose, then it may result into hypoglycemia. Now, vomiting is the symptom which is associated with hypoglycemia. Okay, as we have seen that the deficiency of aldolase B results into high levels of fructose 1-phosphate, which may result into low levels of inorganic phosphate and level of ATP would also be decreased. Now this, um, uh, you can say low availability of ATP in the liver, it may also affect the synthesis of proteins. For example, it may result into decreased production of uh, protein clotting factors. And thus may it increase the risk of uh, hemorrhage or bleeding. Okay, G deficiency of aldolase B may result into high level of fructose 1-phosphate and high level of fructose. Now, fructose and fructose 1-phosphate may be accumulated and thus contribute uh, to the uh, hepatomegaly, that is enlargement of liver and ultimately resulting into liver dysfunction. Now, jaundice may be a symptom which is associated with liver dysfunctioning. So, accumulation of fructose and fructose 1-phosphate may also affect function of kidney and ultimately leading to renal dysfunction. Now, we are going to see uh, how hyperuricemia is associated with aldolase B deficiency and fructose poisoning. So, as we have already said that when fructose 1-phosphate is high, then inorganic phosphate is low and ATP is also low. Then AMP rises. Now, when AMP rises, then its degradation also enhances. So, the degradation product of AMP is uric acid so it may result into hyperuricemia so high levels of uric acid so uric acid levels and lactic acid levels compete with each other for the same uh, kidney transporter so hyperuricemia hence may also result into lactic acidemia Uh, so fructose and any form of fructose <clears throat> that is sucrose or maybe sorbitol remember sorbitol is a sugar alcohol 
which can also be converted into fructose upon its metabolism. So all of these forms of fructose or fructose directly may result into failure of liver and ultimately it may result into death. So what is the treatment available uh, for this disorder? That is to detect the concentration of fructose rapidly in blood and urine and thus uh, go for the removal of fructose and sucrose and any other form of the fructose from the diet. So this is the only solution available. Enzyme replacement therapy can also be done, but its results are not very much fruitful. Mannose and other monosaccharide, which is also considered as the carbon-2 epimer of glucose, this is one of the key components of the uh, proteins, that is glycoproteins, which express themselves on the surface of the cell membrane. Uh, it can also be converted into uh, fructose 6-phosphate. So first it gets phosphorylated by hexokinase, and it results into the production of mannose 6-phosphate. And then with the help of isomerase enzyme or isomerization, mannose 6-phosphate, is converted into fructose 6-phosphate. So the enzyme used for its isomerization is called as phosphomannose isomerase. This fructose 6-phosphate can be further metabolized by glycolysis into its specific products. Now we are going to see that how glucose is converted into fructose using sorbitol. Now, what is sorbitol? Sorbitol is a polyol. Why it is called as polyol? Because it contains many alcoholic groups. Poly means many and all for alcoholic. So it possesses many alcoholic groups. So therefore, it is considered as polyol. This pathway is also called as polyol pathway. Uh, this uh, sorbitol is also called as sugar alcohol. And since it is originated from glucose, this is also called lucitol. Now, the production of sorbitol from glucose is catalyzed by aldose reductase enzyme. And this enzyme basically reduces glucose into sorbitol uh, using NADPH as a reducing power. So NADPH itself is oxidized to NADP, but it reduces glucose into sorbitol. Now, aldose reductase enzyme is found in many body tissues and in many body cells. For example, you can find it in lens and retinal cells. Then you can see its presence in Chavon cells and hepatocytes, in kidney, even in ovaries and seminiferous vesicles. Now in hepatocytes or in ovaries and in seminal vesicle, there is presence of the second enzyme of this pathway, which is called as sorbitol dehydrogenase, which converts sorbitol into fructose. So basically sorbitol, it gets <clears throat> Uh, oxidized to fructose and NAD gets reduced to NADH. So sorbitol dehydrogenase is the second enzyme which is present in seminal vesicles, it is present in the liver and in the ovaries where it converts sorbitol into fructose. Especially in the seminal vesicles, we see that fructose is the main energy source or carbohydrate for the maturation of sperm cells. Now we are going to see one of the important clinical aspects of sorbitol metabolism and we are going to see that how hyperglycemia is linked to sorbitol metabolism. So remember that in the lens, nerve and kidney, entry of glucose is insulin independent. So glucose does not use insulin to enter these cells. So whenever glucose is elevated, for example, when it is seen in hyperglycemia or in uncontrolled diabetes, then this glucose may enter into these cells. So one of the pathways that this glucose can participate into is glycolysis. But when it is present excessively high, then it can result into the production of sorbitol. So this excessive glucose now starts to be converted into this sugar alcohol, which is sorbitol. 
Now, high level of NADPH can also favor this reaction. So, the only or the main enzyme which is responsible for converting glucose into sorbitol is aldose reductase, which is present in lens, nerve, and kidney. So, when more and more glucose is converted into sorbitol, then it may result into sorbitol accumulation. Now, accumulation of sorbitol, it may impart strong osmotic effects and it can imbibe more and more water inside. So, when there is more and more water inside, then it may result into cell swelling. Now, another effect which is associated with sorbitol metabolism here, which is associated here, is that, that there is the absence of sorbitol. So, sorbitol dehydrogenase enzyme is present in low quantities or it may be not present in lens, nerve and kidney. So, as a result of which sorbitol in these cells cannot be converted into fructose as we have seen in the last slide. So, high concentration of sorbitol, it may not be resulted into the production of fructose in these cells due to absence or low quantity of sorbitol dehydrogenase present here. So, this sorbitol due to its strong osmotic effects can, re can result into more and more retention of water and it may result into cell swelling. So, this biochemical phenomenon may ultimately be connected to the development of cataract formation and neuropathy. This may also result into further microvascular complications, ultimately leading to nephropathy and retinopathy. In the part one of uh, metabolism of monosaccharides and disaccharides other than glucose, we have done metabolism of fructose, disorders of fructose metabolism. Then we have seen conversion of mannose to fructose 6-phosphate and we have also completed conversion of glucose to fructose via sorbitol. So in part two, we will be completing rest of the topics. Thanks.